Mike Harmon was first elected in November 2015 as the 47th Auditor of Public Accounts for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. He was elected to a second term as auditor in November 2019. He previously served in the Kentucky House of Representatives for 13 years representing the people of Boyle and Casey County and previously Washington County in the 54th District. Mike is a graduate of Eastern Kentucky University with degrees in math, statistics, and theater and was valedictorian of his Boyle County High School class. During his time in public service, Otter Harmon has always promoted common sense solutions to make life better for the people of Kentucky by supporting good public policy to protect and preserve taxpayer dollars. Otter Harmon brings those same values along with his desire to make government more transparent to his role as auditor. His motto, follow the data, has become synonymous with the role of the auditor's office. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Auditor Harmon. Very good. Thank you, Jonathan. Hope everybody's doing well this morning. First, I want to take just a minute to uh, thank everyone for attending our virtual new officials uh, conference. I uh, certainly appreciate it. And as we said, the weather's a little bit better than we thought it might be. So uh, glad everybody's uh, still jumping on. Uh, before we get started with the training, uh, I wanted to take just a minute or two to talk about uh, how the auditor's office has interacted uh, with uh, both uh, county government as well as the General Assembly. Uh, you know, I had uh, 13 years in the Kentucky General Assembly before becoming an auditor, so we have uh, worked diligently to try to help pass laws that you know make interaction efficient, effective, and ethical. Of course, everybody knows me knows I always like to start with something funny, and since we're on a tight timeline, I'll, I'll do a quick one here, but you know, uh, since we've been here, we've been, <clears throat> we've been uh, kind of uh, like the fellow that invented the quarter rail pillow. Oh, we lost someone. They must have not want to hear the joke. I'm just kidding. But we're kind of like the fellow that invented the quarter rail pillow. We've been making headlines. So uh, anyway, with that, these jokes are always hard to do virtually. So we're going to move on from there uh, before there's comments. Thank you for suspending the chat there, uh, Jonathan. That's going to help us a lot here as we go along. No, in all seriousness, uh, you know, the very first thing I did when I got here is I told everybody uh, we're not going to target anyone. We're not going to give anybody a pass. We're simply going to follow the data. So that's our motto. That's what we've worked on. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, with 13 years, the Kentucky General Assembly, uh, one of the things that we noticed and, and a lot of people with new officials, you, many of you may know, but some of you may not know that uh, we actually invoice for audits. Uh, we do about 600 audits per year. And, uh, you know, really the lion's share of our budget uh, is from uh, basically invoicing for those odds. So anything we can do to kind of lower uh, that cost uh, and still be efficient, effective and ethical, we've worked to try to do that. So kind of give you a, a little bit of uh, some of the things we've worked with in last session. Uh, we worked with the Kentucky General Assembly to uh, work to appropriate some additional funding to offset some of that. Uh, we actually had them appropriating a total of five and a quarter million dollars, 4.5 million of that uh, was basically so that, uh, you know, the two year budget starting July 1st, 2022, uh, we received the 4.5 million in addition to general funds or additional general funds uh, to cover uh, the two year, the next two budget years. Uh, and that basically what it does, you know, previously, uh, when we invoice by statute, when we invoice for fiscal court audits that we do, uh, we would invoice at 50% of that. But when it came to like sheriffs, county clerks, uh, other officials, we would invoice uh, at 100%. So uh, with these uh, this additional funding over the next two years, uh, we will invoice all uh, of the, uh, uh, basically all the county audits at 50%. So that's going to be very helpful. The other thing, and of course, many of the, Counties are already seeing these savings on uh, invoices that were sent after July 1st of this last year for county clerks and for the sheriff's audits. Now, uh, the other part of that was $750,000 that was appropriated, uh, $500,000 in the first year of the biennium, $250,000 in the second year of the biennium that for our outlier audit assistant program. And that's set up to basically assist uh, counties that uh, you know may have had some situations with their audit costs for your sheriffs or your county clerks. Uh, maybe they had something going on. Uh, they had some paperwork that wasn't as put together as well, and it took us some extra time, or for whatever reason. Sometimes there are some reasons that would cause it. 
So what it does, the outlier audit assistant program is set up to assist counties with the cost of sheriff or clerk audits with costs that are more than 150% of the average cost for that particular type of audit. Now, after the county pays up to the 150% threshold, the county will receive a credit from the program funds to cover the rest of their bill. Now, certainly we're thankful to the members of the uh, General Assembly for supporting the additional funding, uh, which certainly will help reduce the cost uh, for local governments while still maintaining the important role of the auditor's office in assuring accountability to the taxpayers. Now, that kind of investment we really consider to be kind of a win-win for everybody. Now, another cost savings that we worked on uh, was uh, Senate Bill 144 that was passed in the 2018 session. And that's what we called our AUP bill or Agreed Upon Procedure Bill. Uh, it uh, dealt really with our sheriffs and our county clerks. You know, we're looking around and we're like, what is there? Is there a way that we can help once again help our counties save money? And, and what we found was that really about 50 percent of our uh, sheriffs and about two thirds of our county clerks were really having uh, a clean financial statement audits. In other words, they, they didn't have any reported findings. So we thought, well, what can we do to work? So uh, some of our staff uh, looked around and uh, there was some law in Ohio that had some differences. So we worked with Kentucky General Assembly, got it passed. And what it does, it allows if you have a sheriff or a county clerk that has a clean audit the year before, they can apply for and generally will receive uh, what's known as an AUP or an agreed upon procedure. Uh, in, in what we have, which is still very transparent, uh, but has less process, uh, and that allows us the cost to be uh, much lower. So over a three year period, uh, 2018, 2019 and 2020, we've seen a total of one point, a little over one point three million dollars in total savings. Uh, you know, these savings from a traditional financial statement audit generally runs, you know, a little bit more than 60 percent, I think, are Shares were saving roughly 64, or county clerks were saving roughly 66. So it you know, it varies, but on average, a little over 60%. So that's dollar saved to the county, and that's a, you know dollar saved. Plus, the other thing, these AUP programs also allow us, you know, to take uh, auditors and be able to take them off low risk audits and put them on higher risk audits. So it's a good use of resources all the way around. Now, finally, the Another bill that we worked on uh, cost savings was House Bill 265, which deals with the sheriffs who receive multiple tax settlement audits, uh, consolidating all of those audits into one single audit engagement. So for example, while our office conducts a fee audit for sheriff's operating budget, we also do separate audit work for uh, tax collection. And every sheriff receives a tax audit for regular real estate but historically, many of them have received additional separate audits for other individual categories uh, if it collected amounts for that were high enough. You know, in other words, they were material in nature and high enough, including odds for gas and oil, unmined coal taxes, and also sand and gravel taxes. So what House Bill 265 did is it took effect in January of 2022, meaning those shares who used to receive multiple tax settlement odds will instead receive one annual audit of all the property tax. So hopefully we're gonna see some savings in that as well with those efficiencies. So those are just some of the examples uh, that we have worked with uh, here, working with counties, working with Kentucky General Assembly. And uh, you know, primarily what we do here is we work with county governments and we work with state agencies and we do a little bit other stuff too, just special exams and things like that. But primarily we audit county governments and state agencies. And so once again, thank you all so much. Uh, if you ever want to see any of the past audits, certainly you can go to auditor.ky.gov and uh, search past audits there. Uh, appreciate you. Look forward to the rest of this day. And if anybody ever has any questions of me, just let me know. And uh, currently I'm going to turn it over to Farrah Petter, who is uh, my assistant state auditor, and she does a fantastic job. And, and uh, I know you all will enjoy. Thank you all. Thanks, Farrah. All right, Farrah, before you get started, I only have one job here today, so I, I've got to announce the bios. I, I don't want to miss somebody's bio today. So Farrah is going to be doing our, our first topic today. You can see it popping up on your screen. You should be able to. Uh, 
It's what is an audit. We thought that would be appropriate to get the day started with. And I want to tell you a little bit about FARA, but I also see that there's some hands that have been popping up in the uh, uh, the group, in the chat. So if you are having issues, remember, uh, we're not going to be able to help you online here. You'll need to email our APA.qualityassurance email address. Or if you can't find that, you can respond to the meeting invite I sent you and I will help you out. So if you're having trouble with anything, send it to there. Uh, with that said, as Auditor Harmon said, Farah Petter is our Assistant State Auditor and she was appointed by Auditor Harmon in December 2018. She began her career at the Auditor of Public Accounts after graduating from EKU in 1999. During her first six years at the APA, Farah worked on state agency audits, including the ACFR and supervised the audit of Louisville Metro. In 2004, she attained her CPA license. She then transferred to work as a county auditor and completed audits of local governments and special examinations in central Kentucky. In 2013, Farah became a county audit manager overseeing 25 counties in southeast Kentucky. And in that position, she managed local government audits as well as special examinations. Thanks, Jonathan. Good morning, everybody. We're so glad to have you join us for our new officials training. Welcome and congratulations on your new position as a new elected official. Um, as Jonathan said, my section is what is an audit? So we're just going to jump right in. Um, some of the information I'm going to go over this morning is I want to give you a little bit more information about the auditor's office. Um, you may or may not be familiar with us, so I want to go over some highlights about who we are and what we do. I'm also going to cover the responsibilities that you have as an auditee and then what the auditor responsibilities are. And then I'll just talk like in generalities about what the audit process involves. Starting out, like I said, just talking to you about the auditor's office. And you've already got to see Auditor Harmon this morning. He's our 47th state auditor. Um, state auditors serve four year terms and Auditor Harmon joined our office in January of 2016. And so this January, he is starting his last year of his second term. The auditor's office has the authority to audit uh, basically anywhere where public dollars are involved. So that would include state agencies, counties, and local officials. And the reason this auditor's office has their authority is it is set out in the Kentucky Revised Statutes. In Chapter 43, um, that's a whole section regarding the auditor's office, and then specifically KRS 43.050 lists out the general function, functions of the auditor's office. Um, so my summary of that KRS is basically the General Assembly wanted to provide for an independent auditing of accounts, financial transactions, and just make sure that the spending of um, any public funds was appropriate. So with that authority, the mission of our office is to be the guardians of taxpayer dollars and provide accountability for how taxpayer funds are used. And then Auditor Harmon has coined our motto, the follow the data motto. And so what that means is we aren't tar targeting anyone and we're not giving anyone a pass. Um, the auditors are out there looking at the data during the audit and reporting their findings appropriately. The employees at the auditor's office were all public servants, um, and we have a local audit division that encompasses audit auditors that live throughout the state. So that enables us to be able to get to all of the counties throughout the entire Commonwealth to do our audit work at the local official offices like the county clerk's offices, the sheriff's and the fiscal courts. Um, we divided the state up into four different regions, and we've called those regions Central, Northeast, Southeast, and West. And we have an audit manager for each one of the regions. And then later on in my presentation, I've got a map showing you those regions. You'll be able to see where your county falls in and who the audit manager is that covers your county. And then also on this slide, I've listed our um, website address, which is auditor.ky.gov. So if you haven't gone there to check that out yet, I encourage you to. It has more information about our office and it also has our released audits. So a little bit about what we do. Um, and one of the reasons I like working here is we're always busy. Um, we perform over 600 audits a year. And um, a little specific information on fiscal court audits is um, we can't get to all the fiscal court audits. Uh, we don't have enough staff to do that. So for a fiscal court audit, they can send us a letter asking for permission to hire a CPA firm. Um, and then we look at our work plan and see if we're planning to do that county. And if we're not, then we will send a letter back and um, grant that approval for them to hire a CPA firm. Um, another thing that we do when we're getting ready to do your audit is we send out an engagement letter. 
And that is an outline that has the responsibilities that you need to do as auditee and also what we will be doing as your auditor. And we try to send that letter about a week or so before an auditor would contact you to set up the actual time for an auditor to come on site. Um, I talked, I wanted to give you some information about what auditors cannot do so that you're not, you know, disappointed and you have some understanding about what the audit process is. Um, as auditors, we're not part of your management, so we can't make decisions for your entity. Um, so some specific things that we can do is uh, we recommend changes and adjusts, adjustments to your financial statements, but ultimately you're the one that decides if you're going to accept our recommendation and make those adjustments. Um, but keeping in mind that um, any failure to do those things can result in some type of internal control issue. Another thing that auditors do not do is we don't weigh in on personnel issues at an entity. Um, we may suggest that you segregate duties between different employees um, because that's a critical feature of your internal control system, but we're not going to give you advice on HR matters like hiring and firing of employees. Another thing that auditors can't do is we can't perform something for you and then audit it. So an example for that would be like, um, if you've not completed your bank reconciliations, we can't show up and then complete your bank reconciliations and then turn around and audit that work. And then another reminder is that as auditors, we're not part of your internal control system. Uh, you can't rely on auditors in your audit to prevent and detect material errors or fraud. So what exactly is an audit? Um, I thought I would start out with talking about the definition of an audit. So an audit is an engagement that's looking at the entity's financial records and giving an opinion on that financial statement. And the time period for an audit is fixed and there's only a few exceptions where the actual time period of your financial statement will be different than the audit period. And in addition to giving that opinion on the financial statement, we are also required by our government auditing standards to perform some procedures to evaluate your system internal controls and then report on any problems that we might find in those internal controls. And then also we're supposed to report on any non-compliances that we see with applicable laws, regulations, grant agreements, and contracts. The audit's going to start with your fourth quarter report that you submit to DLG. That's your financial statement. Um, so it's really important that you make sure that that's accurate and agrees to your underlying records. Also, an important part of your audit is going to be the notes of the financial statements, and these are important because they give more detail to the information that you have on your financial statements. And the Department of Local Government is the regulator for all of you that are on the regulatory basis, which should be everybody but about four counties. And they're the ones that sets the requirements for um, things you do and don't do, and also the requirements for your notes. Um, again, the objective of the audit is that expression of an opinion on whether the financial statements are fairly presented. And we're looking at that in a material aspect. As auditors, we're gonna follow auditing standards when we're conducting our audits and we do that so that there's consistency between the audits. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have to do the exact same procedure everywhere. Um, we use our judgment to make sure that we're doing procedures that would be appropriate for entity. And then another thing to keep in mind is that we're auditing to the rules and the requirements that are out there. Um, we're looking to see what federal and state laws there are. As I mentioned, we're looking at the requirements that DLG has for you in the budget manual. And then also there might be some requirements in the grant agreements if you're having some federal money that you're spending. So we look at that as well. And then another thing I wanted to point out is uh, we're not looking at everything. We're looking at a sample of transactions. And then, as I mentioned, we're going to provide some recommendations to management to help improve processes if we see something that needs improvement. Uh, we talked about what an audit is, so I thought it would be just as important to talk about what we don't do. Um, so like I mentioned, we don't look at every transaction. Um, you don't want us to be there that long to look at every transaction. So we're looking at a sample of items. We also don't confirm that everything is perfect. Like I mentioned, we're not looking at everything, so you can't um, say at the end of an audit that everything was perfect. There's no such thing as acing your audit, and we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. And then also just because you've had an audit doesn't mean that there's not some fraud going on. Um, like I mentioned, auditors are looking at transactions and we're taking materiality consideration. So I don't want you to have the false assurance that just because you've had an audit, that doesn't mean there's not some fraud or some an internal control problem in your organization. And then also keep in mind that um, if you receive a clean audit opinion, and I hope that you do, 
Um, but keep that in mind that that doesn't mean that you need to relax your controls or your oversight. Um, you always want to keep up on that and make sure that you're reviewing that and making sure that your processes are working properly. So here's a little bit more about when I mentioned that you can't ace an audit and I pulled a newspaper headline on this slide and it talks about it says the Whitley County Clerk receives a clean audit. And it said the Whitley County Clerk aced the state audit of her office's financial statement according to the report released next week. And so I wanted to point this out because I think this is a little misleading and I'm saying that you can't really ace an audit because it's not a test that you have the correct answers to. Um, we're out there trying to give an opinion on the financial statements, not seeing if you answer our questions you know, correctly. Uh, and again, remembering that your audit report doesn't mean that everything's OK and everything's perfect. The purpose of an audit is to um, let management know about any problems or issues and making recommendations so things can be corrected. There are uh, three main users of your audit. Um, and obviously the most um, common one, the one that probably comes to your mind right away would be the citizens and the taxpayers. Um, an audit is a good way to provide accountability for how those uh, public monies are being used. Uh, another good uh, user of the audits would be the oversight bodies and the legislative bodies, such as you know, your fiscal courts, the Department of Local Government, any federal grant agencies. Um, and these entities are using your audits in, their, in this way to see um, like what type of revenue you have coming in, the sources, the categories for that revenue, and then how those public monies are being used, how those mon monies are being expended. Creditors and lenders also look at audits. Um, they're looking at it to make sure that the entity is able to repay any loan money. Um, and they're also looking to see like if your current year revenues would be sufficient to pay for current year services and expenditures. Transitioning a little bit to talk about your responsibilities during an audit. Uh, we mentioned this before, um, and, and I can't stress how important this is. Preparing your financial statement, which as I mentioned is recording the report, um, that is really vital, making sure that your quarterly report is accurate. You want to make sure that amounts are reported properly, um, that you have all of the amounts reported on there, um, making sure that line items total where they should, um, making sure you have all your accounts listed, making sure you have you know, your budget column agrees to what your approved budget is. Just making sure that's accurate is really going to help your audit go much smoother. Auditees are responsible for establishing and maintaining internal controls. It's your office, it's your responsibility for making sure that you have things set up properly. Um, that would include designing and making sure that you have controls that would prevent and detect fraud. Uh, audit, as an auditee, you're also responsible for ensuring compliance with any applicable laws and regulations. It's your responsibility to learn about what the requirements are and to make sure that you're following it. Um, you want to make sure that you're communicating with your auditor. If you will try to look at an audit as a team approach between your auditor and you, um, I think that will help you get the best result. And I think you'll be able to work with your auditor in a way where you're providing the information, the documentation that they need. And then one thing you want to make sure too is that you are communicating to the auditor about any concerns you have. Um, definitely, if you know or suspect of any fraud or theft, you want to let them know about that. Um, and then just a little heads up, if you've seen our agenda, we're going to have another session later today that will cover some more bookkeeping and internal controls. So just as important, I wanted to go over what the auditor responsibility, what we need to be doing when we're conducting your audit. Um, and I mentioned a little bit, we're out there following auditing standards when we're conducting audits. We're not just out there making things up. So these are the rules that the auditor must follow when they're conducting your audit. Um, and we also audit to an entity's policies and procedures, what they're saying that they should be doing when they're following a process, um, any laws that would be applicable to that entity, and any of the requirements that DLG would set out. It's really important for an auditor to maintain independence. Um, and so what do I mean when I use the word independence? I'm talking about um, like auditors cannot alter audit procedures and findings based on something that's happening outside of the audit. Um, auditors need to be fair and they need to not allow bias to affect their objectivity. Um, an honest professional opinion is a real trademark of the audit profession, and so auditors need to be objective when they're performing the audit procedures. 
Audits are done and they're planned and performed to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatements. So reasonable assurance doesn't mean absolute insurance. That's why I keep talking to you about how we're looking at samples of transactions instead of looking at every single transaction that would have occurred in that time period. And then um, they're going to also evaluate your policies and your internal controls. So auditors are going to ask you questions about how a process worked. And they're doing that because they need to gain an understanding of how things run through your organization. They might ask you how a bill or invoice is paid, um, who, you know, who receives the information, who enters the information, who can approve the information. Um, and then this is my graphic to kind of give you a visual about the audit process. Um, and just a reminder that you can take a very active role in the process. Um, starting out, I mentioned the engagement letter that we tried to send a couple weeks before um, we arrive on site. When we actually get started on the audit, we have an entrance conference with the officials um, and usually the treasurer or bookkeeper. And this is a preliminary meeting um, to sit down and talk about any questions you have, to let the auditor know about any changes you've had in your organization from the prior audit, and then to ask any uh, or express any concerns that you might have. And then obviously throughout the audit, your auditor is going to be asking questions and um, asking for documentation. And you can also ask you know, any questions that you have during that time period. Um, and I think I already mentioned, you know, it'll help the audit go uh, more smoother and quicker the sooner we're able to get the documents we need and the questions we need answered. And then um, after we get done with all of our work and we've had um, some review of the work, then we set up a meeting with the official uh, to talk about the findings and recommendations we have with the audit. We at this time will also present some draft financial statements and note disclosures. Um, we'll go over any proposed audit adjustments we have, and then we'll ask for management to sign a representation letter. Uh, keep in mind that the exit conference is a draft document. Um, the findings could change based on the response that management provides in the rare circumstance. Sometimes they provide some additional documentation or inform information that we didn't have when we were doing the work. Um, so keeping that in mind, that's not something you want to take and you know, share with your fiscal court. Um, and you will also have an opportunity to respond to all the findings. And then just letting you know that um, if one of the findings is in the report, we present management's response exactly how it is presented. We do redact names, but otherwise, uh, we present whatever they've written. Well, later on in the day two, we've got another speaker that's going to go over a little bit more about the logistics of the audit process and how you can even prepare for that audit. This is a slide I mentioned earlier, um, and Jonathan will work on getting all this information out to you, but I wanted you to have a visual. I mentioned that we broke this state up into four branches, and so here's that visual, and it shows you our four different branches. It lists the audit manager, and you can see where your county falls in there. Also, just as important, this slide is the uh, information we have for you to contact anyone that you need to um, in our audit managers, like whichever audit manager is over your county. And then it has my information, your executive director, uh, Jim Royce, and then our quality assurance manager. So that uh, wraps up my presentation. I thank you all very much for your attention, and I think you'll really enjoy today. We've got a lot of good information. So. I'll turn it back over to you, Jonathan.